Let me paint you a picture. No, not that one. You just beat Xenoblade Chronicles Future Redeemed. You're feeling good about yourself. A bit sad that it's over for now, but you hop on the internet with a glass of orange juice, excited to see the reactions to what you just experienced. And if you couldn't guess, spoiler warning from here on out. And what you find is a fierce debate between the five people who played Xenosaga and all four people who owned a Wii U to play X. Me, that's me, I'm one of the four. And you're wondering, what's going on here? They're talking about a radio and you're just thinking of Zack Ryder. What's going on here? What even is Xenoblade X and why is everyone talking about this game and debating its canonicity with Xenoblade? Why is there seemingly so much passion for this Wii U game that you've never really seen or heard talked about outside of this? Well, I've played the game for quite a long time at this point, Northwoods of 80 hours my recent playthrough, and it was the first Xenoblade game I ever touched. I love the game dearly, and if you want to understand why people hype this game up so much when its UI makes EVE Online look new player friendly, allow me to tell you a tale. A tale of humanity on the brink of extinction, clinging desperately to the very concept of survival, in a world where seemingly everything is out to wipe them out. A tale of one joke, not just run into the ground, but face planted into the ground, over and over and over again about Tatsu being food. Oh, so that's where Genshin got that. And a tale consisting, most importantly, of giant freaking robots. Right. So, brief introduction to the story, so we get a lay of the land and what's going on here. And let me read the back of the box, because it's two sentences that sum up the story. The Earth is gone. Your new home awaits. Essentially, Earth got caught up in the midst of an alien war, and humanity tried to flee to the stars to escape, getting caught in the crossfire. Earth got clapped in dang near every sense of the word, and one ship manages to flee to the stars. That ship is named the White Whale. Eventually, though, those aliens chase after it for some reason, and after suffering significant damage, it crash lands in this new, uncharted alien world named Mira. You play as a character created Jabroni, you know, you make your own character in this game, who you can also totally, by the way, make to look like Dunban and have Adam Howden voice it, who's the person who voiced Shulk in Xenoblade 1. So I call my character Shulkban. You are rescued from your escape pod by the totally not the actual protagonist, Elma, a member of Blade, because it's a Xenoblade game and something needs to be called Blade. If you want to know, Blade in this game is essentially the name of elite soldiers. She escorts you back to humanity's last bastion, a final city from which you will build your kingdom, New Los Angeles, or as it's called more often than not, New LA. From here, you will meet a wide cast of characters and optional party members as you embark on your search for the Life Hold, a piece of the White Whale containing most of the people who embarked on the White Whale. It's a race between you and an alien empire hell-bent on wiping humanity out for an unknown reason to find the remaining pieces of the White Whale and mainly the Life Hold to prevent the extinction of humanity. That is your setting. That is the framework around which Xenoblade X operates from. But do not mistake it. The focus of this game is not squarely on its story like it is in Xenoblade 1, 2, and 3. For Xenoblade X is a gameplay forward experience. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a saying I like to use a lot on stream when I talk about X. For as much as Xenoblade 1, 2, and 3 focus on its characters and story, Xenoblade X focuses just as much on its open-world exploration and gameplay offerings. In my opinion, Xenoblade X is the most enjoyable open-world game I've ever experienced. And I don't know if it's close. And it's for a few key reasons. First off, and this isn't in any order by the way, the story isn't bad. Like sure, it's not as good nearly as 1, 2, or 3, but it's still enjoyable enough and a fun ride. I haven't beaten it myself, but the story honestly just keeps getting better and better and better. And I'm approaching the last chapter of the story, and I know I'm not going to like the ending all that much, but still, like each chapter story-wise has just been getting better and better. It's a genuinely interesting ride. Second off, it understands a very simple de design philosophy that I'm a firm believer makes open world games good compared to their peers. That is the idea that the open world is the meat and potatoes of the content. The world itself is the focal point. It doesn't serve as a glorified loading screen or simply to elongate your playtime as you traverse an empty world to go from point A to B. The world itself and exploring it, understanding it, and experiencing the world is the point of the game and focus of the game. And X excels at this. In fact, exploring the world was a point of advertisement for X. Heck, let me read you the back of the box again. You flip this over, and on the back, at the very bottom, earn your own robotic scale and customize it to take on gigantic enemies head-to-head -head and travel to new heights. If you can see it, you can reach it. If you can see it, you can reach it. Well, what's the hype about that? It's an open-world game, duh. Not like it's the only game that's ever done that. Well, when you have zones and set pieces that are as sprawling and beautiful on the Wii U, mind you, as this... 
Well then, yeah, that sense of exploration will be fortified, at least it was for me. This is some of my favorite zone designing locations in any game ever. I want to go to these places and find ways to reach them. Now, let's talk about a core design philosophy that, in my opinion, is critical to this game's success. The scale mechanic. It is, in my opinion, one of the greatest, most enjoyable, multifaceted gameplay mechanics in any game I've ever played. It's a work of genius. Sure, it has its issues. It feels annoying. Having to spend credits to repair them if they break and you don't have insurance is annoying. Yeah, that's a thing. But good god, what skills allow you to do in this game. And I won't spoil when, but at some point you'll unlock a side quest letting you undertake a series of prerequisites to gain your skill license. It's a grind to be sure, but once you get your license, all of a sudden the game changes completely. Mobs that were too hard before become manageable now because you have a giant freaking robot. Gaps that were too far to leap across now become stepping stones because, again, you have a giant freaking robot. It can transform into a vehicle to move about the map faster, which is great for great sprawling sections like the desert landscapes of Oblivia. You already have no fall damage, an amazing addition for an open world game, by the way, but your jump is naturally big, which is great for exploration. But then you get the scale, and it becomes comical. Cliffs once too large to traverse now become manageable because, again, giant freaking robots. Once you unlock your scale, the game changes in such a fundamental way, where everywhere you explored at first becomes recontextualized. Because you now have access to places you couldn't get to before, but that's stuck in the back of your mind. New treasures, probes that you can plant in certain places to unlock passive income and resource generation. Mobs you feel like a weight that was taken off your shoulder, as you can fight all these new mobs. Get these new quests, do a whole bunch of things you just couldn't do before. As the change in perspective changes not only how the game plays, but feels. The world feels smaller when you're in a scale. It's a really cool feeling. It's one of those gaming moments that to me rank in my Mount Rushmore. It's incredible when a game just lets you do what you want to be able to do and doesn't hold you back. Because the scales are also customizable with different weapons and parts you buy or find that give you different arts to use in combat. You can change its colors like it's an armored core and rename it. And you can assign different scales to your other party members so you can roll up in a squad of mechs which looks awesome and feels powerful. But there's a sense of risk because because scales have fuel and can break on you if they take too much damage. There's a sense of freedom, but also tension, that just rounds out everything into this incredible package of gameplay exploration. That's not even to mention that you can unlock flying in this game. Right, so again, picture on the back of the box advertising this, but at a later point in the story, after you unlock your scale, even later than that, you unlock the ability to fly in your scale. And it's closer to the end of the game, but there's still a lot to do once you unlock this. Everything I just said about unlocking skills to begin with, double that and pass it here. Unlocking flight was a moment that was just pure simple fun, and was on stream for me. Everything becomes accessible, new areas become navigable, you can fight while flying. The creativity and breadth of imagination in this world takes center stage for all to see and witness, because the world of Mira isn't a one and done. You don't just explore the world once and feel like you've seen everything. Danger looks everywhere, with secrets all over the place. It does that Xenoblade thing where it has high level mobs all over the place that kind of lock you off and add a sense of danger in the early game, but become accessible later on. And I love that feeling. I love the feeling that I'm growing in this world, and by my act of growing and investing time and resources into this game, I can now explore more and play more. I love that feeling of progression. And it's at these intermittent stages of your skill progression that the world just opens up and blooms more and more. The world is filled with various things to do and prioritize. You have multiplayer quests. Yeah, it's a Xenoblade game with multiplayer, by the way. I don't really touch it myself, but... There's a really sick feature where you can grab other people's characters and use them as one of your party members if you want. And other people can be really freaking good at this game and building out their characters, by the way. You could also undertake multiplayer quests where a group of you could take on tough fights, etc. The world also had things like the collect the PDF, which for each zone, which incentivized grabbing various nodes that give you resources in each zone. Wasn't much, and you didn't have to do it, but you got little figures you can put up in your barracks if you got them. Oh yeah, you have a barracks that you can customize, by the way. Again, you don't have to do it, but it helps add a sense of individuality and uniqueness to your living quarters that you utilize during the main story or when customizing your skills. It's a little home for you and your party. The affinity system from Xenoblade 1 makes a return, sort of, but they really lean into it, with having affinity quests for each character and party member that may require certain affinity ranks as a prereq. You have your blade rank, which is separate to your overall level and class level. This is essentially your military rank, which at each level you get a singular point you can invest in either mechanical, biological, 
or archaeological, which lets you collect from various nodes across the world to gain blade levels, you undertake activities fitting what division of blade you enlist under. And there's quite a few of these, I think there's like eight. I went Harrier, so I get especially rewarded for fighting unique mobs and high level stuff like that. But you could go to the one that rewards you for node collecting, or for putting down probes, or for doing like side quests. It's not all just combat centric, there's variety here. And honestly, the one for node collecting, in hindsight, may have been the one I should have gone with because I collected a bunch of these things. But there's a bunch of them with their own specializations that you can still do whatever activities you want. It's just something to manage. It's something that rewards you just a little bit more for doing what your specialization is. You can build up your skills by getting and investing in stronger and stronger ones and equipping them with various kinds of gear you can find or buy. Nothing by itself is complicated to do, but it's when all these individual mechanics work together that the world feels really populated with things to do, especially with the metric crapload of side quests that are on offer here, on top of affinity quests, which in my opinion are pretty dang good, as they help flesh out the cast of characters and give character to people you ordinarily would have overlooked. Makes the world feel bigger. The game is grindy to the extreme for certain quests, and it's massively annoying. Something to be rectified in the Definitive Edition, in my opinion, as some drops are rare by themselves, but also the game goes full Monster Hunter here, where you can target specific limbs or parts of enemies to break them off to get additional loot, while altering what mechanics the enemy can use. It's a really cool system by itself, but trying to grind out a specific rare horn from a mob, where you have to make sure to break the limb before killing them off, can honestly drive you a little crazy at times. The game has its problems, 100% it does, and some of those are quite severe. The UI is one of the worst I've ever seen. The game can be extremely hard to get into because of the number of systems that are poorly explained to you. It's a game in need of a definitive edition to iron out these issues. Oh yeah, probably a, the biggest pet peeve for me. There's no audio balancer, so the music just plays during cutscenes, just drowns out the dialogue, and it's extremely hard to hear at times. It's just a bunch of little things like that which leave me scratching my head as to how this made it out of QA. But then the game gives you a moment like unlocking scales or flying or strolling into a location you'd always seen but couldn't get to before, and you just find a super boss just sitting in there. Or the game will play you some of the most beautifully constructed and orchestrated and executed music I've ever seen. Ever seen Attack on Titan? Yeah, that guy did the music for this game. Yes, it's awesome. Just look up Uncontrollable and thank me later. Or the flying music. My god, the flying music. The act of flying has its own theme song, by the way. It's incredible. The sense of freedom that song elicits is perfect. The Way is my personal favorite. It's a slower vocal interpretation of another song called Theme X that, in my opinion, is one of my favorite vocals tracks in the entire series. It's incredible. Sure, the new LA night and day themes are a bit of a meme and are very polarizing, but honestly, I don't mind them and find them kind of funny. Even though the night theme is basically, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's just in your ear over and over again. The story and execution isn't the best. It's been getting way better in the later chapters, especially the one I did on stream lately. But dang it, there's just something about it that I still find myself invested. The game understands Rule of Cool and understands how it can use Rule of Cool, its music and certain characters to prop up scenes that lack a lot of the storytelling techniques the main trilogy used to convey emotion and stakes in development like cinematography, even though even that's been getting better. It's a deeply flawed masterpiece in my opinion, but in my opinion, the strengths of the game are so high, so engrossing, so captivating, that it's not only one of my favorite open world games ever, it is my favorite open world game ever, and one of my favorite games of all time in general. I love this game. It was my first Xenoblade game I ever played, and it'll probably end up being the last one I finish. Not a bad way to bookend a series, at least for now. So thank you all for tuning in, my pleasure making the video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like and subscribe, it really helps channel out and help support future content, and I greatly appreciate it. Stay safe everybody, have a great day, go play some video games if you can, and hit the bell icon to be notified when I upload in the future. Have a great day everybody, bye bye everybody, and I'll see you all next time, until we meet again.